Hi everyone, I'm Jack the Rambling Rack and Turn. I hope that you're doing well. I'd like to lure you into a discussion of The Fisherman by John Langan. This is a great horror novel. And I really mean that. I started reading it this past weekend and I was hooked. I was so caught up in the narrative that I read through about 190 pages in just a few hours. Um, because, because Langan's writing is very strong and, and the layering within this novel is very strong. It's a horror novel, it's a cosmic horror novel, and it's a book that belongs sort of at the pinnacle of that resurgence we've been we've had going on for about a decade in the cosmic horror subgenre. And so it, it really works in amazing ways. Uh, the emotion is very strong. The characterization is very strong. And then the, the horror, the storytelling is just fantastic. Um, and so, so it, it really is a great book. It's one I would recommend, but it's filled with grief, uh, that palpable emotion. And it, it's a very authentic sense of grief. Uh, is what we open the book with, and it, it's something that never really goes away from the narrative. Uh, and then that's, that of course would be something that some readers don't want to experience, so I would say don't read this book. But otherwise, I, this is just a fantastic, fantastic cosmic horror novel. So I wanted to give a quick reading of you know, what's Langan's writing like, and then let's talk about the book itself. What streamed from the enormous eye was either so deep below or so high above any discreet sentiment as to be unrecognizable as such. There was only absence, a void as big and grand as everything. It wasn't white or black. It wasn't anything. Perfect in its nothingness, its nullity. It had been contravened somehow, sundered, confined to the form before me, imprisoned but not separated. It was the black ocean. To understand this, to appreciate it, might the be, be the beginning of a kind of wisdom. It was not a wisdom I had any desire for. The great beast's awareness saturating the very air, I ran into the woods. The trees grew more closely together here, their leaf crowns closer to the ground, the outermost branches weaving around one another. My arms brushed an especially low-hanging limb, and what felt like a dozen razor blades parted the sleeves of my raincoat and shirt, and the skin they covered in as many places. I sucked in my breath, stumbling as the pain flared up my arm. But although the fingers of my other hand came away bloody from their explorations of my entries, I did not slow my flight. Uh, and that's towards the end of the book, but, but the, the horror there is real. And it, it is that cosmic horror, that philosophic horror, that sense of um, the nothingness of space, the fear of nothingness um, within reality, the sense that, you know, underneath the, the, the reality we perceive, there is this, this void uh, or there's this chaos that just churns and, and who knows what terrors lurk there. And this is something that goes back and back into the history of human thought. The Babylonians, the Egyptians, um, in, within the Hebrew Bible, there are mentions of this idea that, you know, there, there is almost a separation of our world and our, our structure from chaos. Uh, and, and that is what this book is going to explore. So it opens, as I said, with a grieving widower, a man who's going to unspool his tale. There'll be the tale within the tale. And having lost his wife, he shares how um, when she died of cancer shortly after they were married, he seems to lose purpose. He's just does, he's not going to work. He doesn't want to spend time with anyone. Um, he, he doesn't want to spend time with himself. He feels like he's lost everything. And then he happens to go fishing one day and that sort of rescues him. He, he claims it saved his life. And so when a work colleague loses his family in a horrifying accident, he thinks maybe, maybe this will save my friend's life, you know, Dan's life. And we have about 50 pages of, of their friendship, their relationship. How do they um, grow together through, through these next steps uh, as grieving widowers, as one of them is a grieving father, as fishing buddies. And then one day, trapped in a diner, it's a rainy day, uh, Howard, who owns the diner, starts to unspool this tale. <laughs> and the narrator, th th there's all of these layers going on. The narrator shares, you know, what I'm about to share was told to me, but there are parts of it that weren't told to me then and that I've had to find out or that, you know, I I sort of recognized within my mind or memory or a dream without ever having realized what it was. And, and that cosmic horror starts to become very blatant. What was um, a, a novel of grief and, and one where there were, you know, men who were wondering, had, had they heard the voice of a wife? Had they uh, sort of seen a ghostly face for a moment. And that, that type of horror now becomes very blatant cosmic horror because the tale of the fisherman, uh, the tale of terror, takes us way back. Uh, and we're, we're back hearing a little bit going on in the 19th century, quite a bit uh, takes place in the early 20th century, in 1907 to 1910. And uh, it's a tale of 
this disgraced professor from Heidelberg, a philologist, with his family who finds a job as a stonemason, helping build a reservoir uh, way out there, um, outside of New York City, in, near the Catskill Mountains. And that's where they start to find out that uh, some guy who's been living for over 100 years uh, has some guest at his house and there's strange goings on. And of course, it, it, it starts to build up <laughs> this sense of, of fear, of terror. Characters sense that something is wrong, but they can't quite pin down what it is. Or they, they think they, they, they grasp some uh, aspect of what's wrong, uh, but they can't see everything. They, they don't see the whole picture. And our narrator is able to, to share much more with us. And it, it works startlingly well. Um, when, the, uh, w when there is this crisis, I should say, I don't want to spoil too much, but when there's a crisis, the philologist along with the group goes to sort of make an end of this. And uh, we start to find out his tale, that this is a tale that has gone back for a long, long time. I had been laboring over. It was as if I had been struck by lightning. I rushed out of the house to find Wilhelm in his office at the university and show it to him. It appeared we were onto something of genuine significance. How significant we did not appreciate until we began our attempts to speak what had until now been confined to paper. The second book had provided us with a great many clues as to how this might be accomplished. Along with cryptic warnings about the need for care in doing so, we dismissed these as rhetorical flushes, inserted to lend the text a more ominous character. We were wrong. The first word we tried to pronounce was dark. It was among the most common of the words we'd encountered, and we felt confident we had its pronunciation settled. Although we scoffed at the second book's warnings, we waited until a Sunday when my family was safely asleep to attempt our experiment. We shut the door to my study and uttered the word. The room was plunged into blackness. I did not understand what had happened. I thought something had gone wrong with the lamp. This did not explain why the hall light was not visible at the bottom of the study's door, or for that matter, what had become outside of the city lights outside the window. The blackness was so complete we might have been in a deep cave. Uh, and th that's what we start to, to spend some time with. We have this character who has, in his youth, discovered uh, forbidden books and started to draw links between them. He has a mastery of multiple languages and with a colleague, he starts to unravel some of these mysteries and we find out the, the real horror that befell his colleague and what has brought him to this, you know, disgrace at his university, fleeing as an immigrant to America, and ultimately now working as a stonemason out on a reservoir in 1910 New York. Uh, but he, his knowledge, his arcane knowledge, allows him to confront the guest, to confront the, the evil that has been brewing, and in a sense to discover, you know, what has lain underneath. Um, and so the, the book just is a fantastic journey. Once that tale within a tale concludes, the sort of Leviathan that's lurking within the center of the fisherman, then we're back in our narrator's present and he, he finishes his story of the fisherman, of his encounter uh, with the aftermath of that horror. And uh, it, it, it comes to a crescendo and then a, a surprising resolution. Uh, but, but it's a very, very effective horror novel. And it's peppered throughout with some great references to Moby Dick. There's one character who sort of screams uh, lines that Ahab has at the very uh, beginning, or at the very end of Moby Dick. <laughs> um, we also have Abe you know, opening the novel saying, you know, call me Abe. And so th there are these Moby Dick references across there if you enjoy those types of things. But I would recommend this novel. Um, it does, as I mentioned, fall in with the great cosmic horror resurgence. Um, Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer would be another work that I think is part of that. And uh, there are more than a few similarities, sort of the idea that there's an otherworldly space within our physical realm uh, that takes place in both novels. I would add um, more, th there are some great cosmic horror references here that, that feel close to the cosmic horror that we think of with associated with the Cthulhu mythos, um, but they're not as blatant as the Black Gods, um, not the Black Gods, uh, The Ballad of Black Tom by Victor Laval or Ring Shout by Peter J. Lee Clark, which are very explicit, like Thulhu mythos stories. It does feel close in a, a few ways uh, to the great To Walk the Night by William Sloan, and I'll uh, put my link uh, to the description of this novel in the description notes below, along with that of Ring Shout. 
And I, I would say there are some ways in which the setting really works to its effect as it did in The Elementals by Michael McDowell, which isn't really a cosmic horror book, but uses its setting so effectively. Here we have uh, the, the, the woods, the forests, the streams, and then of course, the other world. <laughs> so let me know if you've read this one. I heard about it from the great Michael K. Vaughn in his list of great horror novels, and I, I get why he appreciates this book so much. I look forward to reading more from Joe Langan because that was a great horror novel. So hope everybody's doing well. Thanks.